Richard, thank you so much for agreeing to, to talk to me again about the state of the United Nations. Um, a little bit later than we did last year when we spoke at the time of the opening of the General Assembly. But I think going back to last year is, is probably an appropriate place to start. When we, when we spoke, um, Trump was still um, in power. Um, a number of uh, people were looking forward to him uh, leaving the White House, partly because he would give the United Nations a more friendly uh, White House. And I wonder whether you'd care to reflect a little bit upon that, what you know, the US change of administration has meant. Also, when we spoke, um, the, the Secretary General um, was still waiting to be or to get his second term. And um, of course, he did that uh, uh, this past summer. And I wonder also whether that um, has led to a, a more activist um, uh, uh, Secretary General. I mean, one of the criticisms in the view of some against him that he's always been exceedingly cautious when it comes to, to crisis, um, whether this, this second term has, has altered that. And more generally, um, when we spoke last year, of course, the, the dynamics of the Security Council was very fraught. We looked at a number of the different files uh, from Syria to Yemen and others. And of course, we touched on Afghanistan and a great deal has changed there. So I wonder whether you could give us a very brief or give me a very brief sense of, of where we are one year on um, in terms of the dynamics of the Security Council, particularly in relation to the to the management of, of, of crises. Well, let's let's start with the change in US leadership. Uh, which has come, unsurprisingly, with some major changes in the US approach to the UN. I mean, by the end of Trump's term in office, uh, you know, US diplomacy at the UN uh, over COVID and other issues had become highly erratic and sometimes you know, pretty destructive. And actually, in New York, we could see that morale in the US mission uh, to the UN on First Avenue was declining. There was a sense that American diplomats in New York were often cut off from their masters in Washington. And this lack of US support for the UN was feeding into a broader sense of malaise around the institution. And if you go back to late 2020, and you look at the way the UN responded to the start of the war in Ethiopia, or the war over Nagorno-Karabakh, there was a sense that the UN just couldn't respond in considerable part because the US didn't have a plan and didn't want to work through the UN. Things were very bad indeed. Now, we have seen some clear and obvious changes since Biden took office since Jan in January. Uh, Biden and his ambassador uh, to the UN, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, kept on telling us that America was back and that mel meant multilateralism was back. And in a lot of ways, they've lived up to those slogans. Uh, the US has rejoined the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Uh, Biden stopped the process of withdrawing from the World Health Organization, which Trump was boycotting over COVID. Uh, just a few days ago, the US uh, won a seat on the Human Rights Council, which Trump also boycotted. And so we have seen the US re-engage in a pretty systematic fashion with bits of the UN that Trump hated. And beyond that, talking to diplomats in New York, they will tell you that uh, the mood in US-UN, the US mission has improved a good deal, uh, that American diplomats are suddenly civil and constructive, whereas previously they were either disconnected or actively unhelpful. And so, you know, overall, the uh, you know, morale at the UN has improved quite a lot, thanks to Biden. But there are still uh, some fairly big problems uh, overshadowing the organization. Uh, this has been a year of crises. Uh, hitting the UN often without much warning. Uh, the coup in Myanmar, uh, the fighting between uh, 
the Israelis and Palestinians in May, uh, and then very obviously the collapse in Afghanistan, uh, have all shaken the UN. And it hasn't always seemed that the Biden administration has really had a plan for dealing with these crises um, through the UN, uh, or indeed more generally. Uh, the Biden administration is primarily focused on domestic issues. Uh, Biden only really came to the General Assembly session at the UN for a day in September. He, you know, he's not going to devote a lot of time personally to, to UN diplomacy. And in addition to that, the Biden administration is very focused on the strategic competition with China. And, you know, the UN is, to be honest, pretty secondary to the competition for power in the Asia Pacific. And so there's a sense that Biden, Secretary of State Blinken, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, you know, all feel broadly benign towards the UN, but it is not high on their uh, strategic radar. And so it has, it has definitely been a period of re-engagement for the US here, but it's still been somewhat limited. And that's come through in some cases, such as the May, uh, the May conflicts between the Israelis and Palestinians, when the White House made it, made it very clear that it wanted to deal with that problem bilaterally, it wanted to get a deal with the Israelis, and it really did not want the Security Council to engage in the crisis. So yes, the US is back, but the US is back with caveats, I think we might say, yes. in, in the UN. Yeah. Uh, we can talk a bit more about the US relationship with China here too, because I think that's a, a very Absolutely. interesting part of the equation. Yeah. As to uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, he won a second term as Secretary General pretty easily in, in the summer. Uh, he had the support of all the permanent members of the Security Council, and he didn't face any serious opposition. And he obviously is somewhat liberated by the fact that he now gets to work with a, a US administration that, broadly speaking, wants the UN to succeed, as opposed to the Trump administration, which was always threatening uh, more budget cuts and more political headaches for Guterres. He's begun to stake out uh, a vision for his second term. He's really focusing, unsurprisingly, on climate change. He's really focusing on the recovery from COVID. And he's uh, you know, talking a lot about the need to deal with inequality globally. And I think those are all themes that actually he can pursue knowing that the US will be, will be supportive. What we're less clear on is whether he's going to become more outspoken on some issues. Uh, like human rights, which he has been criticised for uh, underplaying during his first term. Guterres in general seems more comfortable right now talking about you know, big global threats like pandemics uh, rather than highly sensitive political issues uh, like human rights or um, crisis management uh, in, uh, in regions where the big powers are involved. And so he's definitely expanding his focus uh, but there are still, again, some limits to what he can he can risk doing. Um, we can get down into the um, into the specifics and nitty gritty of um, some of the crises you mentioned too. I think it's definitely worth saying that one of the big questions that I'm watching here as a UN observer is what the role for the UN in Afghanistan will be, oh. and uh, this I think is going to be a huge test, frankly for all parts of the UN, because after the fall of the government of Ashraf Ghani and the rise of the Taliban, uh, you know, Afghanistan is teetering on the brink of many, many interconnected crises. There's a risk of more violence. We're seeing terrorist attacks coming back up. Uh, there's a humanitarian crisis. There's an economic crisis. Afghanistan could fall apart very easily. And it's actually the UN that is going to have to provide the safety net uh, across all these areas, whether it's in terms of humanitarian aid um, or human rights monitoring, because the US and Western powers can't play that role alone anymore. So they're going to need UN assistance. Mm 
what form that UN assistance takes, uh, whether Russia, China, and the US can agree on what the role of the UN should be. I mean, these are huge questions that I think we're going to be talking about for the next three to six months or, or longer in, in the UN. And so that's a big focus right now. Yeah, well, I'd like to pick you up just on, 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 on those issues and, and Afghanistan as a, and as an example. Uh, fascinating, fascinating insights. I mean, you mentioned relationship between the US and China. Um, now, on the, on the one hand, um, Biden, you know, signaled that um, diplomacy is back, but so also uh, is, is a concern with, with human rights. Uh, and, and of course, uh, for all his faults, um, uh, Trump was very pragmatic when he came to putting human rights issues on the agenda. And I was wondering whether the, the commitment uh, to, to bringing human rights back onto the agenda is something which can complicate um, relations, especially with China. Now, on the other hand, um, when we look at Afghanistan, uh, I think what is interesting here, I mean, as you, as you recall, I think he was a former Secretary General uh, Tant in his memoirs who said that great problems come to the UN because member states don't really know what to do with them on their own and the UN has a natural role to play in those circumstances. Um, in the case of Afghanistan, I think it was inevitable that there would be a fair amount of gloating necessarily on the part of the Russians and the Chinese um, after the humiliating collapse of the regime but that gradually uh, or deep down they would realize it's in their own interest uh, to make sure that the country doesn't implode and that some of the scenarios you portrayed, um, uh, it won't sort of play out. And I wonder whether that provides some kind of basis for, for an agreement unspoken or unarticulated between the member states in some geopolitical sort of areas and centers. And it's very interesting, I think, because I've had uh, you know, individuals and, and missions talk, approach me just to talk about what UNAMA might look like. And a lot of it seems to hinge on what kind of agreement you can get among the, uh, uh, within the Security Council. And I wonder whether you see, see any prospects for that happening. And I mentioned the human rights bit first, whether that becomes an obstacle uh, in, in the way of reaching an agreement with a more pragmatic agreement based on, 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 on interests which each of these neighboring countries and the US has in preventing Afghanistan from imploding. We're just using that as an example, but we can extend it to other, other cases, of course, where we had crisis over the past year. I mean, you mentioned the Horn of Africa and you mentioned Myanmar. But what, what, what is your sense of how the dynamics of the council will, will play out? On the one hand, a US which is prepared to be engaged, but also which insists that principles and human rights are still important. How do they square those? Well, I mean, overall, I think we have seen tensions over human rights uh, at the UN affecting Chinese-American relations in the Biden era. Uh, for example, when we look at Myanmar, for example, uh, it's very, very hard for Western countries to ignore the awful human rights abuses that are taking place there in the wake of the coup. The Chinese look at Myanmar and they see it in terms of regional security and regional stability. Yeah. And they don't really want to um, uh, put human rights in the foreground. And so we're seeing quite a lot of tension over that uh, now in UN forums. Obviously, you know, the US has also continued, uh, as it did in the Trump era, to use the UN as a platform to raise the situation of the Uyghurs in China itself. Mm -hmm. And that is a source of uh, great irritation um, for the Chinese in New York and also in Geneva. But I think Afghanistan is a slightly different case because, as you say, there is a recognition that at root, uh, all of the permanent members of the Security Council, and especially China, Russia, and the US, have an interest in uh, creating some sort of stable framework for managing the situation in Afghanistan. And that is something that has come through council diplomacy to date. Uh, now, there have been some people who have said, well, why doesn't the UN send a peacekeeping operation to Afghanistan? Uh, the council is not going to take any risks like that. What I think the council will grope towards is uh, agreeing a political framework for ongoing humanitarian action uh, in, 
in Afghanistan. So the council will put its political weight behind um, the work of the World Food Programme, uh, getting food into the country because you know, there is uh, an awful food shortage to be dealt with. Uh, there will be political support to the count from the council for the World Health Organization, undertaking vaccination campaigns in Afghanistan, and so on and, and so forth. And I think this is the the overall direction of travel um, for uh, for council engagement um, in in the Taliban's Afghanistan. Uh, the other issue which the council will I think focus on with a broad degree of consensus amongst the P5 is how to contain and limit terrorist threats emerging from Afghanistan. Yeah. And uh, you will continue, I, I suspect, to see uh, a pretty good degree of cooperation in New York over sanctions uh, lists um, involving Al-Qaeda or Islamic State um, targets uh, who, who may be operating out of Afghanistan now. So that's the good news. And it's actually quite unusual because it does look like a first order crisis where the P5 has, um, you know, a modicum of uh, a modicum of, a, of sort of common areas of agreement that they can work off. Yeah. The problem is, as you say, that the P5 do not agree on human rights mm -hmm. uh, and whether human rights and especially women's rights should be a, uh, a central issue in dealing with the Taliban. For the US, but actually possibly even more for some of its European allies, it's really important that uh, the UN should play a role in monitoring and protecting uh, human rights and women's rights in Afghanistan. And that's also true, I think, for some of the elected members of the council, such as Ireland and Norway. On the other hand, if you are the Russians, if you are the Chinese, or indeed if you are the Indians, who are currently in the first year of a, a two-year council term, Afghanistan is fundamentally a regional security problem. And all those powers, with very different emphases, are going to want to try and focus on maximizing stability and minimizing security risks emerging um, from uh, from Afghan territory. And to be blunt, I don't think that the Chinese and Russians are going to sign up to uh, Western demands that the Taliban should prioritize uh, human rights going forward. Uh, they are going to say, no, we need to deal much more pragmatically with um, the government in Kabul. And at the end of the day, our security is, um, you know, affected much more by, um, by Afghanistan than Norway's is or, or Ireland's is. Um, so I think we are going to see a big ideological fight over human rights. I think the big ideological fight over human rights in Afghanistan will fill the headlines. Yes. But beyond the headlines, there will be quieter cooperation on uh, humanitarian issues, CT issues. Yeah. And I, 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 I don't think the P5 will allow the human rights debate to completely sink uh, collaboration on, on those other topics. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I think it's a fascinating insight, and I would tend to agree with it. I mean, how, how important do you think it is for that to play out in the right kind of way, that the Secretariat plays an important, constructive, and convening role in this? I mean, I come back to the Secretary General himself here, having kept a fairly low profile in relation to this. I've always, and often, as you, as you, as you know, emphasize the importance of getting the right people in the right positions, who they appoint as the next SRSG, for example. Do you think serious thought is being given to that? Because it seems to me to be an important, important issue, looking at the Secretariat support for, for, for these plays to, to, to play out. I think there is a lot of serious thought going into this, although it's worth saying that I still find that diplomats are talking about these medium and long-term issues uh, in slightly hypothetical terms, um, not least because their governments are still focused on much more immediate problems in Afghanistan, such yeah. as getting out remaining yeah. nationals or trying to evacuate people who worked with NATO um, and whose lives are under threat. I mean, those, those sort of first order um, concerns continue to take up quite a lot of diplomatic uh, time and energy. But looking forward, 
yeah, I do think there's sort of some serious thinking going on about what sort of frameworks for cooperation will be necessary. There's also a, uh, a debate um, building up about under what conditions the UN should offer the Taliban formal recognition yes. as the government in Afghanistan. And that is one uh, small piece of leverage that uh, the UN does have over the Taliban, that you know, at some point the General Assembly could recognize them as the rightful rulers of, of the state. And that's something which is being discussed um, a, a good deal uh, around Turtle Bay. Uh, what's interesting about personnel and what's interesting about the way the UN engages in Afghanistan though is that it's really going to come down a lot of the time to the humanitarian agencies for the reasons we were just saying and so you know the World Food Programme leader David Beasley has met with the Afghans the uh, High Commissioner for Refugees um, uh, Grandi has met with the Afghans yeah. a lot of the way the UN engages with the Taliban is actually going to be through agencies you know often headquartered in Geneva or Rome, rather than through yeah. the uh, you know the Department of Pe Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, based in New York. Mm -hmm. Now this means that it's a bit harder to track exactly how the UN is dealing with the Taliban, um, because you have a lot of different agencies with a lot of different priorities mm -hmm. um, talk talking to them. Mm -hmm. But I think you know for you, Matt, and for your, for your students, I, I think this is also an interesting turning point, because here we have a major crisis that the UN cannot respond to with peacekeeping mm. and you know it can't really i mean it can't really respond to this with mediation um or the good offices of the secretary general alone mm. it's got to rely on the humanitarian agencies yes. and in a period in, where, in which we see un peacekeeping shrinking overall yes. i think this may be a bit of a model for un crisis management in future that a lot more of the burden of crisis management um, falls on the humanitarians um, and there's less space for the UN to play a, uh, a big political role. So, I mean, Afghanistan may be a turning point in a, in a, a, in a broader sense for the UN too. That, that was, that's interesting. And in fact, it leads me to another sort of set of issues I just wanted you to, to, to respond to. Um, and this is the future. And I know you've written about this, the future of these large um, peace operations we have, particularly on the sub sub-Saharan continent, uh, South Sudan, DRC, Central African Republic and Mali. Um, again, um, there's you know, supposed to be change coming up here. Uh, the drawdown has been reported um, to be in, in preparation for a long time in MONUSCO. Um, whether or not it will happen is still uncertain. Where elections are supposed to be scheduled for for uh, UNMIS, and we have this constant discussion, both in the academic circles and among policymakers, about, about the drawdown and the future of these missions. Where, where do you see the Security Council on, on, these, on these different operations? I mean, will there come a point? I mean, if you take MONUSCO, I think the first time the French and the Americans said it's time to pack up and return was in 2014, 2015, and here we are, we keep renewing them, partly because of the concern with protection of, of of, of, of civilians, which is an interesting sort of counter to the idea that we live in an increasing world where we do not concern ourselves with, with, with humanitarian crisis. But I wonder what you, how do you see these, perhaps these four major operations in particular, without going into detail, sort of playing out now, how long can we continue to renew the mandates of these fairly sizable uh, missions? And, and where do the, the different council members stand on that? You know, I think the interesting thing is that the Afghan crisis is going to play into discussions of all these remaining big UN peace operations. Because I think the basic lesson that a lot of diplomats are going to take away from what they've seen in Afghanistan, even if it's a very crude lesson, is if we pull the troops out, things are going to fall apart. Yeah. And, uh, you know, actually the situation in uh the Congo, for example, is, is very, very different to that which prevailed in Afghanistan. It probably isn't that useful an analogy. Yes. But, you know, diplomats in some ways are quite simple people. Um, they will see the headline and no one will want to be sitting on the council now saying, oh, it's fine to draw down the remaining peacekeepers. Um, there's no risk of a return to crisis because there will always be this nagging sense that no, you know, Kinshasa could be the next Kabul. You could see... Um, uh, a collapse there, which would be a humiliation for the UN, 
just as yeah. what's happened in Afghanistan has been a humiliation for NATO. So I, I think that uh, you will see the council taking a pretty cautious approach now to drawing down its remaining missions. And that will be especially true uh, when you look at, at Mali, um, which some people have called the UN's Afghanistan because that is where you do have very considerable uh, jihadi groups attacking the UN. I think, again, there will be a sort of a concern that if the UN does draw down in, in Mali, which is something which the previous US administration in particular had floated, then you will just create another vacuum which um, Al Qaeda and its affiliates will be able to take over. So I, I expect we're going to be in a, in a cautious state. And let me um, let me say I think there's going to be one other case that people will be pointing to, arguing for caution, which is what is going on right now uh, as we do this interview in Sudan, mm. because um, Sudan was another country where the UN, until very recently, had sizable peacekeeping forces. Um, after Sudan started to move towards civilian rule, uh, the UN pulled those peacekeepers out and simply left a small political mission in Khartoum advising the transitional authorities. And then just today, uh, there has been a, mil a new military coup in Sudan. Um, it looks like the civilian transition may be over. And I think you will find some officials in New York saying, well, look, that's just another example of what happens when you pull the troops out. Um, actually, you create a political vacuum um, uh, that can lead to more chaos. So you know, a lot of people have been talking about the end of UN peacekeeping for a long time. Uh, it's always a long time dying, yeah. as yeah. you say. And I, I think that events in Sudan and Afghanistan will probably... Uh, yeah, persuade the council to move cautiously elsewhere. Yes. Okay. Richard, I'd like to, you know, kind of bring this uh, proceedings to an end. Uh, I've been incredibly uh, uh, grateful for your incisive comments. I want to sort of um, just perhaps finish on what's a bit of the talk of the town here in the, in the UK, and of course that's the uh, climate uh, conference now. Um, coming up in Glasgow, and I'm not going to go into, you know, what might come out of that, but I'm interested here, as, and you've touched on this in some of your writings, about the role of the, of the, and the attitudes of Security Council members with regard to the link between security and climate. As you know yourself, the Germans um, last year, I believe, suggested a position should be created within the Secretariat to deal specifically with the climate and security. Um, there's a lot of discussion about what the precise linkages are. A lot of them have sort of been identified in resolutions as, as obtaining in, in the Sahel and in some of these conflicts we just talked about. Others are saying that the, the links are, are less direct and less linear than we'd like. And the Chinese and the Russians have, uh, have long, of course, been more skeptical about whether this is really something the Security Council should uh, concern itself about. Do you see any movement on this front, uh, not as a direct consequence necessarily of COP or the whole focus on it, but is there a sense in which the Security Council might be uh, reach some kind of agreement on, 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 on looking more systematically at the linkages between uh, uh, climate change um, and, and security, and if that is the case, to introduce you know, mitigating and uh, uh, effects in specific operations, or do you think this is one you know too many for the Security Council? I mean, we're currently in a situation where uh, Ireland and Niger are leading a push for a Security Council resolution on climate change by the end of this year. And the focus of that resolution, as, as you say, is really just on systematizing and improving the reporting that the UN gives to the Security Council on how climate change is affecting uh, conflicts and, and conflict risks worldwide. In, in many ways, quite a modest proposal and uh, much more modest than what is being discussed in, in Glasgow. But it does continue to run into opposition from uh, Russia and China I think primarily because they are just wary of the council expanding yes. its definition of peace and security. <clears throat> we don't know how it's gonna finish up. Uh, there is some evidence or, or at least some hints that while Russia is you know, deeply skeptical 
of a resolution. The Chinese do not want to be seen as uh, actively blocking uh, action on climate change at the moment. So the Chinese may just change their position and allow this resolution to pass. And if the Chinese change their position, then you know the Russians could be persuaded to abstain as well. I mean, on a, on a broader scale, I would say that what comes out of Glasgow is going to be really crucial to the future of the UN more generally, and not just in terms of the substantive impact on, on global warming, but also because if the US and China are able to sort of find common ground on a really significant package of um, pledges on fighting climate change in Glasgow, that I think will give be a stimulus for efforts to cooperate in other fields, despite the overall sense of competition between Washington and Beijing. Yeah. By contrast, if Glasgow is seen as a bit of a dud, and in particular, if China is seen as not really um, pulling its weight in, in Glasgow, uh, then that I think is going to provide some ammunition to those who argue that actually multilateral cooperation is a non-starter in an age of major power competition. And if the US can't get major concessions from China on global warming, then it will be harder for US policymakers to try and work with the Chinese on other files. So Glasgow has, I think, some really, really broad and long-term um, political implications for, uh, for cooperation at the UN in general. Terrific. Well, uh, I think we'll, 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 we'll finish there. Uh, extremely interesting. I think there is a, as you said in your most, I believe your most recent report for the ICG on the challenges ahead, there is a sort of paradox that I think, if you look at the history of the UN as a whole, that, you know, we obviously lament the sense of crisis and the fractures within the Security Council um, and and all the, the sort of negative developments, yet it's precisely... Uh, when that happens that the UN's role come into its own almost because we live in an intergovernmental, it's an intergovernmental organization and we live in an anarchic system in a sort of a headly bull sense of the word um, where the UN does provide a, a, a vehicle for trying to reconcile those differences. Um, uh, so I think we'll be back again talking about these things again in the future. But thank you so much for doing this and um, we'll, we'll stay in, in, in close, close touch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. This this one will run and run. It will. <laughs>